Has your life been changed by Jesus? Are you thankful that your life has been changed by Jesus? He is a good father, a good, good father. He's perfect in all his ways. I am so thankful for who God is, for what Jesus has done in my life. And if he's changed our life, the challenge that we just heard is it's time to get to work. It's time to get to work. Now, that is a perfect introduction for where we are going this morning and for our topic this morning, which is government. Are y'all ready to have a message about the government today? All right. Address the mess. I find it so fitting that we just got done reading a passage of scripture that told you to pay your taxes when we're less than a week away from many of you having to write a check to Uncle Sam. How many of you are still having a hard time swallowing that check that you had to write? Anybody in here this morning? I want you to know that our prayer team will be available to help you at the end of the service and assist you in any way that we can today. It's very fitting that we're there, but guess what? God expects us to have a healthy relationship with government. It's expected of us as believers. He's given us a purpose, a calling, a mandate, a mission. That applies to every single area of our life, including to this area called government. So the title of my message this morning and also next week is called Christian Citizenship. Christian Citizenship. Do you recognize The complexity of putting both of those words together. You have Christian and you have citizenship. If you are new to the church, you will hear a phrase that is often repeated over and over, which is goes something like this. We are in the world, but we are not. There you guys go. Y'all are good this morning. Everybody's with me. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Romans 13 verse 1 The very first statement there reminds us that we are in the world. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The higher powers is talking about government and their officials. It's not just talking about the United States government. It's talking about whatever government you live in and you find yourself under. We are in this world. But if you are a Christian, who does your citizenship, who does your allegiance ultimately belong to? It belongs to Christ, God, Jesus, yes, all of those are right. It belongs to him and his kingdom. That's ultimately where our allegiance belongs. The Bible tells us that we are to view ourselves as strangers, as foreigners in this world. The Bible tells us that we are pilgrims. We are just passing through. We are longing and looking forward to the day when Jesus is going to return to the kingdom of heaven where we're going to be for all of eternity. Are you looking forward to that day? Are you looking forward to being in the presence of Jesus where you don't have to deal with the things of this world any longer? What an awesome day that that's going to be. What makes this passage so interesting to me is I have never studied a passage. I kid you not. It's it's almost funny to me in a sense. I have never studied a passage which on its surface is so clear and so simple. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. But at the same time, where almost every single commentary and message that I've listened to instantly jumps to the exception clause. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, but here's all the ways that you don't have to be. It's, it's in every introduction, and I'm doing the same thing here this morning. I'm already going straight to the exception clause. And the more that I thought about it, and obviously the more that I studied this passage, the more I realized that this makes perfect sense. And the reason why this makes perfect sense is because Christians are on a collision course with secular society. And if we want to go back to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 for just a minute, I believe we should have those even ready to go up on the screen. This is where Paul transitions. The book of Romans is filled with incredible doctrine and teaching about God and who he is and his mercies and how this plan of salvation works. And then you get to Romans 12 and everything from here to the close of the book is all practical application. And he begins chapter 12, verse one with this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, it's authoritative. It's a command. He's pleading. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, Christians, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then you get to verse 2, and it begins with this statement. Everybody help me out, just that very first statement. And be not conformed to this world. If we're going to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices... The very first thing that he says is, be not conformed 
to this world. Our allegiance to Christ will put us in direct opposition with secular society, with this world. Paul, and I find this just to be powerful to me. Paul's writing Romans 13, knowing full well everything about governments and the abuse of power and different things like that. I mean, he's living in a time under the Roman government. By by the way, what did the Roman government do with Jesus Christ himself? The government and its officials put the Son of God on a cross and condemned him to death. Paul is writing this knowing full well that his very life is at stake, knowing full well that he will be beaten, knowing that he will be thrown into prison, knowing that that it could cost him his very life. What could cost him his very life? His rebellion against the government? No, his proclamation of Jesus Christ and his gospel and the gospel truth to a world that was in desperate need of it. Paul is writing this to a group of Roman Christians who are living under the reign of Nero, who are gonna suffer persecution for simply being believers in Jesus Christ and the gospel of who he is. And in spite of all of that, we still get Romans chapter 13. There's a whole lot here to unpack, and there's a whole lot here that we can learn. So are y'all ready to dive right in? Are y'all interested this morning? No sleeping, okay? I know it's cloudy. Afternoon naps are coming, all right? There's a lot of good practical stuff here, so let's just dive right in. Number one is this. Government is God's idea. First thing that we got to see from this passage is government is God's idea. Look at verse 1 with me. We see that command. I've mentioned it many times. Let every soul be subject unto the higher Powers. Here's the command to submit, and it's instantly followed with a reason, an explanation. Everybody help me with the end of verse 1. It says, For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained by God. Government is ordained by God. He sets government in order. In other words, government is God's idea. The Bible's not specifically clear as to when human government was formed. It was most likely after the flood in Genesis chapter 9. There's a passage there that talks about capital punishment. If you take a man's life, your life shall be required of you. And if the laws are going to be made and enforced, there's going to have to be some sort of a government, some sort of an institution that's set up to do that. The bottom line is this. Government was God's idea. He's the one who ordered it. He's the one who set it in place. He raises up governments and he brings governments down. Go ahead and put Psalm 75, 7 up on the screen. Let's look at what the Bible says. And you can find verses like this repeated throughout Scripture. It says, but God is the judge. He put it down one, and he setteth up another. Do you believe that God is sovereign over all things? I believe that he's the king of kings. He's ruling and reigning on his throne. He can do what he wants, when he wants, as he wills. And there's a big principle here. Every human government is accountable to God and is accountable to maintain its affairs with justice and righteousness. Now, you might be thinking where a lot of people go with this, there have been countless kings and pharaohs and emperors and dictators, flat-out evil men. They have completely abused their God-given authority, and make no mistake about it. When they abuse their God-given authority, they will answer. They have answered, and any that continue to do that will answer to God ultimately one day. Make no mistake about that. But the authority is given to them by God, and even those who misuse and abuse it, it does not change the fact that God is still ultimately in control. Government is God's idea. Therefore, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Look at what he says in verse 2 to state it more emphatically. I'm going to have you guys help me out with some of this, okay? Whosoever therefore resisteth the, what's it say? Resisteth the ordinance of God. And then read that last line with me. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Be obedient or be punished. It's not just necessarily talking about being punished by God. It's also being talked about being punished by, if you want to make it as practical as can be, by the government authority. If you don't obey the government that you're under, don't be surprised when you find yourself being punished or being in direct opposition to the government that you live under. All right, so government's not God's idea. Therefore, obey. That's what he's saying to do. Now, these are not blanket statements that we must submit to no matter what. But there is a great principle here. For God's sake, 
for mercy's sake. We, as believers, are called to be model citizens. Remember where we ended last week? We were talking about um, human relationships with our enemies last week, and we were talking about not responding with vengeance, and there was a really powerful verse there, and it said, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. You know what the Bible's teaching us? That Christians are not first and foremost. We are not anarchists. We are to be model citizens. We are to bend over backwards to show honor and reference to God-given authority that has been placed in our lives and where we can and when we can. We must submit. That's what he's telling us to do. That is our primary purpose and focus on how we should look at things. Government is God's idea. We recognize that civil authority is God's idea for this age, and he wants us to be law-abiding citizens, okay? So government is God's idea. But, you like those buts? But government is not God. Government is God's idea, but government is not God. Now, there is a very awesome and powerful scene that takes place in the Bible between Jesus and Pilate. All right, the the Jewish authorities are the ones who wanted Jesus dead. Jesus came on the scene and he was messing with them. He was turning everything upside down. They wanted him dead, but they didn't want to be responsible for the blood, uh, his blood being on their hands. So they bring the Roman government in and Jesus has to go stand before the Roman governor, Pilate. And he comes in before Pilate. And when he's brought before him, the first question Pilate asks him is this, art thou king of the Jews? And Jesus looks at him and he responds and he says, do you say this of yourself or did somebody else tell you this? And Pilate looks back at Jesus and he's like, am I a Jew? He's like, your own people brought you to me, okay? What in the world have you done? They want to kill you. (laughs) And Jesus says back to them, back to Pilate. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Listen to this. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? Remember how Peter and and all of the disciples of Jesus, they wanted to take the sword. They wanted to fight. They wanted a revolution. They wanted to get, but Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here for a bigger purpose. I'm here for a higher calling. I'm not gonna stoop myself to this level of of, uh, these everyday situations. There's a bigger purpose at hand. There's something greater at stake. And I'm not trying to minimize the everyday situations. I'm just trying to say there's a bigger priority. All right, and then, Pilate, after that answer, he goes back to the Jews and he says, I find no fault in this man. Take him back. I'm not doing anything with him. But the Jewish leaders at this point, they're so worked up. They're they're not going to be done. And, And they get the crowds worked up and they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate goes back to Jesus and he says, well, where are you from then? And you know what Jesus does? He responds with silence. He says nothing. Pilate gets so worked up, he gets filled with indignation. And he says, don't you know that I hold the power of life and death over you? And Jesus just calmly responds with truth. You would have no power at all against me, except it were given to you from above. Do you understand what Jesus was saying? Rome, the superpower of the world, had nothing but delegated power, nothing but delegated authority from the throne room of heaven itself. And the only reason why Jesus was there and the only reason why Jesus allowed himself to be subjected unto crucifixion was because that was God's plan from eternity. And Rome was playing exactly into God's plan and was the tool that God was using to get the job done. So government is God's idea, but government is not God. You know what we believe as as believers in Jesus Christ? We emphatically believe and state that Jesus Christ is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is ruling and reigning on the throne and our allegiance and our uh, submission ultimately belongs to him and him alone and him first and foremost above everything else. And guess what? That is a political statement. It's always been a political statement. Can you imagine Paul standing before Nero and saying, I ought to obey God rather than man? Jesus is my king. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is a political statement. What we have to understand as believers is that we take our marching orders from God and from his word and from Jesus. And our allegiance ultimately belongs to him first and foremost above everything else. Here's the practical application. 
pledge allegiance to Christ. I brought some props here, and I brought one of these Christian flags this morning, and I got this from one of the classrooms, and the reason why is, you know what our students do every morning here? They stand up, and they start every single day with the pledges. They pledge allegiance to the American flag, and then they get to the pledge of allegiance to the Christian flag. How many of you know the pledge of allegiance to the Christian flag? I want to say it this morning because it fits perfectly with this point, but I just realized that if we're going to say this, we need to stand up to our feet, <laughs> okay? So help me out. If you know this, I want you to pledge allegiance to the Christian flag this morning. It goes like this. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Excellent job. You may be seated. Now, you know what we can do so easily? That pledge that we just said, it can become words, But if you want to take that for a minute and and break that down, unpack that just for a minute, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior crucified, risen and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. So if there's life and liberty to all who believe, what's the opposite that's at stake? We can't just say that and take it for granted and forget about everybody else that's in this world that may not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. One day, the Bible tells us that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It doesn't matter who doesn't submit to Jesus today. It doesn't matter who's not willing to pledge their allegiance to him. One day, every single knee will bow. Remember the video that we watched at the beginning of the message? We have been given a purpose, a calling, a mandate, and a mission. If your life has been changed, it's time to get to work. It's time to get involved in what God has put us on this earth to do. We can, and we must be the best citizens that we can possibly be, but we also must remember why we are here in this world to begin with and to never forget it. I was uh, texting the other day Mark Walker. Mark is our founding pastor's son, and he also served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from the state of North Carolina. And uh, I just had some different questions about uh, the message and that I was studying. I just started texting back and forth, and I just said, hey, do you have any advice that you would give? And he, he said a bunch of things, but there was one statement that he said that really just stood out to me. Here's what he said. The gospel is itself offensive, Nothing else should be. Understand? The gospel is itself offensive. Nothing else should be. Do people see our political positions first or do they see Christ? And I think that's a powerful thought that we need to meditate on. If we are there and we are making a difference and impacting our world as subjects of Jesus Christ first and foremost, and if our ultimate goal is to live according to the mandate and mission and purpose that he's given us, which is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel and to lift high the name of Jesus, then what people should know and see about us first and foremost is Christ far before they see the political passion that we have. Now, does that mean that we should not have political passion? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that our allegiance is ultimately, first and foremost, to Christ above everything. And our goal is to let Christ be seen and Christ be magnified and Christ be known above everything else. That really, (laughs) there's a tension here with all of this, right? Just like there's a tension in so many different areas of our life. We need to be good citizens, but we ultimately obey Christ. There's a collision course between believers in this world. Man, there ought to be a whole lot of prayer, and there ought to be a whole lot of being filled with the Holy Spirit that goes into how we approach and how we talk about the government and how we be involved in politics because ultimately our goal and our aim is to point people to Jesus above everything. So that's number one. Government is God's idea. Number two, government is intended for good. Government is intended for good. Government has two God-given responsibilities. We're going to look at it. Look at verses 3 through 4 with me, okay? Verse 3, it says this. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt then thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And then the very first line of verse 4. Y'all help me out with it. Here is what it says. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. 
One of government's God-ordained responsibilities is to promote good. I think our government has largely, but sometimes imperfectly, fulfilled this role throughout our brief history. I, I, I was just thinking a lot about this this week, obviously preparing for this message. You realize that a lot of what government does is promote and honor good. You have, for instance, a lot of different awards. If you go and just Google different awards that the government gives out, I mean, you'll see a long list there. But you'll see things like the Presidential Medal of Freedom. You'll see things like the Citizens Medal. You'll see things like the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's just scratching the surface. Have you ever watched the State of the Union address before? Almost every single State of the Union address, they have special people that they recognize up in the gallery, typically for some of their honor or bravery or good things that they've done to make a positive impact in society. Hey, even down at a local level, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary this past year, and we had one of our county commissioners come and read a proclamation that the county of Santa Rosa thanking West Florida Baptist Church for the impact that it's had in the community for the past 50 years. That's one of the roles that God's given to government to promote and um, to promote good and to highlight it so that hopefully it will be repeated and hopefully it will be followed. But there's also another God-given responsibility that government has, and that is to punish evil. Look at how verse 4 finishes off. It says, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, next two words, everybody help me out. Be afraid, for he beareth not the what? In vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Government was given the sword. The divine right to execute God's wrath, to do what's ever necessary to punish evil. Do you understand this? Government's God's idea, and one of the reasons is so that government will punish evil. It means this. Government has the divine right from God to defend itself. Um, Just a week or so ago, we were in New York City, and we went to the 9-11 Museum. Man, every time I go there, I am reminded of the day that that happened. How many of you still vividly remember all the events of September 11, 2001? What's crazy is we have kids that are graduating from high school now that weren't even alive back then, and they just have heard our stories and different things about it. But I remember being in there, and I remember just all of those feelings come back. You know that government had every single right to protect and defend itself? And that government was given the sword and had every right to go execute and go uh, execute God's wrath upon the terrorists and their organizations and upon the governments that harbored them? Do you know that the nation of Israel has every right to respond to the unprovoked attacks that they have experienced because they are a government that was ordained and established by God? And when you are provoked in that type of a way, they're given the sword to be able to execute wrath? Do you know that government has every right from God to establish a police force and a judicial system? Do you know know that we live in a sin-cursed world, right? How many of you know that? There's a lot of messed up people, right? There's a lot of broken people. Guess what? We're messed up and we're broken too. Now we might say, well, I'm not as messed up and broken as others. The point is this. We live in a sin-cursed world. And if evil goes unrestrained, it's only going to get worse. Before the flood, the Bible said that every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and it only got worse continually. I mean, things just spiraled out of control. Can I say this? Just very matter of fact this morning, defunding the police will never be a good idea. And one reason why is because it goes against what God and his word says, that government was given the sword to execute judgment. Now, does that mean that that people have the right to abuse that authority? Absolutely not. Again, we are responsible and accountable to God. But don't skip over the fact that government is God's idea because we live in a sin-cursed world and even imperfect governments are going to provide more of a sense of security than if there was nothing at all whatsoever. How many of you just see the common sense in God's order and God's design? Are you all with me this morning? Everybody here? Okay. All right, good. So government is intended for good. But, you ready for the but? But government needs a guide. Government is intended for good, but government needs a guide. If government is charged with punishing evil and rewarding good, how does it go about deciding what is good and what is evil? 
Is government in and of itself the source of morality? And the answer to that question is what? No. And by the way, our world, again, this, this is no common sense to this at all, but where there is no foundation for truth, you know what the end result is? Chaos. If truth is subject to whatever you think truth is and whatever I think truth is, how in the world are we all going to get along? How in the world are we going to ever come to any conclusions on that? There is truth. We can't magically create our own truth, and neither can a president, a congress, or a judge. I believe with all my heart that this book right here is the guide and the foundation and the source of all truth. Now, I know that there's a lot of people in this world today that, that don't believe that and that want to undermine it, but this still does not change the fact that God is the creator of heaven and earth and that God has given us his word and that this book contains the foundation for all truth. The Bible's the guide. Deuteronomy chapter 17 gave some very, very, very wise advice to the kings of Israel before there was ever even a king. And that wasn't even God's original plan for the nation of Israel. But in his foreknowledge, he knew that there would be kings one day. And he says, if there's ever kings in Israel, tell them to write and copy their own personal law of God and to read it and keep it with them and to read it every single day of their lives and live by the truth of God's word. Wouldn't it be awesome if governments and their officials, if they got up every day and they spent time in this book and they let this book guide and direct them in truth, wouldn't that be incredible? I believe it would be. But guess what? That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen unless the church fulfills the role that God's put it in this world to do. The church is the conscience of the state. You understand that's our role. We are to be in this world, but not of this world. Remember, why did God leave us here? Why don't we just get saved and get to go to heaven right away? Instantly when we get saved and everything's perfect. Wouldn't that be awesome? But you know what? He left us here in this world. And one of the things, he not only called us foreigners in this world, and he's not only called us pilgrims just passing through, but he's also said, you are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of another kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Christ. And it's our job to positively promote and to point people to a greater government, a greater God, a greater king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the one and only true God. That's our job. That's why we're left here in this world. Hey, throughout the Bible, you will find a priest or a prophet standing beside a king or a, a man or a woman of God. And they're highlighted more so than the magicians and the advisors and even the generals. It starts way back in the book of Genesis. By the way, if you're new to Christianity and you want to start, start in Genesis, man, there are some incredible stories there. One of the stories you're going to come across is the man by the name of Joseph. Joseph has an awesome story. Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. Things go well for him. He experiences great fortune there. He rises to the ranks. Potiphar puts him in charge of all of his house. And then Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. And Joseph, being the man of character that he is, runs from the situation. And then Potiphar's wife gets mad and has him thrown into prison where he spends years of his life in prison. One day, the Pharaoh has a dream. None of his magicians, none of his advisors, none of his astrologers can interpret the dream. He couldn't even fully remember. They couldn't tell him what it meant. I mean, duh, that's impossible. <laughs> and he's threatening them with their life. And finally, one of the king's servants remembers a man named Joseph in prison who had interpreted one of his dreams and it had come to be right. So they pulled Joseph out of prison and they put him before Pharaoh. And he not only tells him his dream, he tells him the interpretation of it. And he tells him what God wants him to do as a result of it. And Pharaoh's blown away and he makes Joseph the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. Now Pharaoh has a man of God in a position of influence and can steer him in a direction where God used him to do great good in this world. That's just one story, man. You can go to, uh, there's a prophet named Elisha. I like this story because of the practical application of how these things can play out. There's a prophet named Elisha. There's a Syrian king named Naaman. And the Syrian king had a servant girl in his house who was from the nation of Israel and he got leprosy 
and he wasn't getting better and there was no solutions for his sickness. And this little servant girl, I don't know, eight, 10 years old, something like that, says to her master, she says, there's a prophet in Israel named Elisha. He's a man of God and God can do great things through him. You should go and see him. So Naaman, this powerful general, has to humble himself and go before a prophet of God and say, I need some help. And you know what Elisha says? Okay, fine. God will answer your prayer. Go to the Jordan River and dunk yourself seven times, and on the seventh time you'll be clean. Naaman's appalled. He's like, the Jordan River's small and dirty. It's not beautiful like the Euphrates in my home country. And he was going to leave, and his servants talked him into staying, and he has to humble himself and go dunk himself in the Jordan River, and on the seventh time he comes up clean. A miracle that only God can do. And now you have a powerful general going back to an ungodly nation who has seen firsthand the powerful hand of God. I could go on and on. We went to um, Sight and Sound. Have any of you ever been to Sight and Sound before? Lancaster, they have one. Branson, if you can go see Daniel at Sight and Sound, go see Daniel and think about Romans 13 and you will be absolutely blown away. I'll just leave it at that. I'm just giving you a taste. And, and, and by the way, put in Pastor Mike and you'll receive 10% off of the dis- Just kidding. That's not true. <laughs> but I gave him a nice plug. Maybe that'd be nice if they give. No, just kidding about that. Anyway, it's awesome. Here's my point. These were not just token religious advisors, but these were men and women of God who spoke God's truth, the power, and often they paid for it with their very lives. You know what the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4? That the church is the pillar and ground of truth. If we are not passionate about the truth of God's word, if we're not living by it, first and foremost, by the way, we can't just go wave this book at our government officials and say, obey God, while we go out and we disrespect it every day of our lives by not submitting to it and doing what we want. And I feel that that's where we're at in our country today. We want things to change, but will the church of God get on its knees and pray to a God for a revival and for him to do a work that we're not capable of doing? Will we get up every day? Will we live holy lives that are sanctified and set apart to Christ and his kingdom? Do we get into this book and find out his will for our lives and pursue that above everything else? That's what we're left here in this world to do. And if we're not doing it, Don't be shocked when the world is falling to pieces around us. And don't minimize it. Listen, I think sometimes we minimize. We say, what can we really do? Do you understand that we have the Holy Spirit of God? Do we understand that we have a God that can put people like Daniel in positions where he can influence the most powerful man in the world? And Joseph and Esther and the list could go on and on and on. Here's the last practical application, we're done. Influence your world. Influence your world. Before I grab my next illustration. Okay, the government was given the what? The government, the, the, the symbol of authority that the government was given was the? Yes, there you all go. You all are good, okay? The sword. All right? Well, when the Bible talks about the church, it often refers to the church as a what? Light or a lampstick. Like Matthew 5, 16, for instance, says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When you combine the light and the sword, what do you get? You get this really awesome weapon right here. You get a lightsaber. By the way, this is, a really, this is not just any ordinary lightsaber. This thing's got weight to it. This is a legit lightsaber. It is made for dueling. I could put on my Star Wars uniform, and you could too, and we could come up here and duel for hours with this thing right here. This is, this is pretty cool. It's not mine, but I'll just say that, throw that out there. No judgment if you love Star Wars and lightsabers, okay? I love that. All right, so anyway, lightsaber. This is a pretty unique weapon, right? It's so unique that it's not even what? It's not even real. Now, there are people that are working very hard to try to make this become a reality. I I actually Googled lightsabers. I nerded out a little bit this week on this message, okay? And uh, apparently there's some, I don't know if it's quite a lightsaber, but like there's this lightsaber that exists that you can put this 30-pound pack on your back and you put yourself in all this tinfoil looking stuff and the fuel in the backpack can make that lightsaber heat up to like 4,000 degrees and it can do all kinds of damage, okay? So it's really not real, but it's kind of real. 
How many of you are just totally wondering where in the world we are going now? We got a lightsaber, and this is going in an interesting place, all right? Can I tell you that when you combine light and power, you get something that's absolutely incredible, something that's almost not even real. And can I tell you this, that I believe with all my heart, for the past, how many years has it been? 250 years almost, the United States of America has almost, I believe, in, in essence, accomplished something that is unique and something that has been so different. Because you've had a government with all of its power that God has blessed and it's prospered, but you've had a huge, heavy influence at the same time by the church. And the United States of America has been a beacon on a hill for so many people, and it still is today. Think about the people that are trying to get in here at all costs and I'm not saying that we're perfect, and I'm not saying that we have a perfect history because we absolutely don't. But one thing that's beautiful about America is it has self-corrected often throughout its history. And a lot, large part of that is because of men and women of God who have put Christ and his kingdom and biblical principles even over and above political positions and political parties and different things like that. And when we're willing to stand on the truth of God's word unashamedly and un unapologetically and we're able to have that type of an influence, God can do something that's absolutely phenomenal and absolutely incredible. Influence your world. I want to read you this quote by Martin Luther King Jr., which it's powerful. He says this, The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. And then he says this, If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal. We will be nothing more than just a social club with no moral or spiritual authority. And by the way, that is happening all over the place today. I want to close with this story. I have a friend. Some of you have heard me tell this story. It's one of my favorite stories ever. But I have a friend who, you all remember years ago when the oil spill happened out in the Gulf? Well, it became a big political thing, like everything becomes a big political thing. And President Obama didn't show up fast enough, and people started calling out for him to show up and to come to the area and to show concern for the damage that it was doing on the economy. And so finally he comes to the area, and uh, my friend was on his way home from work, and the road that he was driving on got shut down because the presidential motorcade was coming through, so he had a little bit of time on his hands. I don't know if he had the piece of cardboard in his van. Somehow he got his hands on a piece of cardboard and a magic marker, and he wrote on it, Mr. President, what took you so long? And he's by himself, and he gets out in front of the limo, I mean, we get out in front of his car, and as the presidential motorcade comes by, he's just silently just holding that sign up on the cardboard sign. The motorcade goes by, the excitement's over for the day. He goes home, and the next morning he wakes up, and guess what? He is on the front page of the Pensacola News Journal. <laughs> Mr. President, what took you so long? Now, you might be wondering, what in the world does this have anything to do with prophetic zeal? We're talking about prophetic zeal. You know what happened when he saw that? He did something that's foreign to me. He got convicted about it. I probably would have been sending that out to all of my friends, neighbors, relatives, like, I'm on the front page of the paper. He got convicted by it. You know why he got convicted by it? Because of God's word, which says that we're to pray for our authorities. And in verse 7, which we didn't get to today, but he says, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And he recognized God just convicted him about it. And so he decided to take the a copy of the front page of that paper. He cut it out and he personally wrote President Obama a note. And he said, President Obama, I am a Christian. I am a believer. And I want to apologize that I did this. The Lord convicted me. And I find in his word that I'm supposed to pray and I'm supposed to give honor to whom honor is due. And he was able to share Christ in that letter as well. And he sends it back off again, thinking nothing of it. He just puts it in the mail. His conscience is clear. He did what God asked him to do. Well, lo and behold, a little while later, guess what comes in the mail? A handwritten letter from President Obama himself. And in that letter, and by the way, this is a whole different part of the story. <laughs> I'll tell you this too, and then I'll come back to it. 
They were also were praying about a certain amount of money that they could give to missions. This is not made up either. This is real. It sounds almost unbelievable, but they were praying about a money that they could give to missions. Well, when that letter came in, it was verified that it was actually the president's signature. And there's all kinds of people willing to pay for that stuff because they save it for his presidential library one day. And they gave him like a $4,000 check for a copy of that letter. And then he was able to give all of that to missions. So just incredible. But he gets the letter back, and from that letter it said... It said to my friend, it said, you are the, you are, and people like you are what built this country and made it great and continue to do so. And he just sent him a very nice and a humble letter back. And here's the question that I think about from that too. What do you think had a bigger impact? The sign that said, Mr. President, what took you? You think that President Obama looked at that and even thought twice about it? <laughs> if you're going to be president of the United States, if you're going to be in politics, you've got to turn out all of the noise and all of the naysayers. You know what that is? That's just noise. It just goes in right along with what everybody else is doing. But you know what got his attention? You know what made it to his desk? Something that was completely different. Something that was out of the ordinary. Somebody who got convicted because this book means something in his life. Somebody who obeyed Christ and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And as a result, the President of the United States heard a clear presentation of the gospel through a letter that had a profound enough impact on his life that I'm not saying it saved him or anything like that, but I'm saying that he responded to it and God used it in a powerful way. That's just one example of ways that we can have a profound impact in our world and on our society. And all I'm trying to tell you and all I'm trying to remind ourselves is, just as laying a foundation, we're going to come back and talk about some more practical things next week, is we've got to remember, our allegiance is to Christ, but if we will take his word seriously, and if the truth of God's word will burn inside of our hearts and inside of our souls, that we can't do anything but live by it, that we can't do anything but obey it, that we can't do anything but lift high the name of Jesus and point people to Christ, I promise you, we can still make a difference for Christ. And it doesn't matter how big or how far your personal influence goes. I know this, West Florida Baptist Church can influence Santa Rosa County and make a profound difference and an impact for Christ. And if there's other churches like this in other communities and in other cities who knows what God can do and all I'm trying to say is we are here for a reason and the way that we submit and the way that we honor and the way that we obey not just Christ but even in our world that he's put us in the hard work the tension the getting on our knees and going before the Holy Spirit if we're willing to take it seriously and live for the audience of one and live with that purpose and that calling and that mission and mandate in our in mind what can God do in and through you to make an unbelievable difference for his honor and for his glory